there's plenty of room up front, so if you want to see better, feel free. We, there's even comfy seats right here. Mmm, comfy seats, yeah. Just a thought. Anyway. Por los que uh, usan interaccio, si no está funcionando la tecnología, necesita el español. Cuando empezamos, uh, vamos a tener uh, un speaker allá en el centro parroquial uh, con la traducción, si no está funcionando sus propios uh, dispositivos electrónicos. Ok. Right. As people are making their way in, we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll get started because you are all here and we got a lot to cover. So let's begin with prayer. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord God, we ask for your grace. Come Holy Spirit, fill us with your divine wisdom and love so that as we study your word, we would fall more in love with it and with you, Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. All right. Um, I've been asked to make a special announcement because today uh, one of our, our youth, uh, Felipe Alexis, is celebrating his 18th birthday today. So he's joining us on his birthday. Happy birthday. I want to say a prayer and blessing for him. Mighty God, we ask that you would bless your son and your servant and give him many happy years in your service. Fill him with your Holy Spirit and grace. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Happy birthday, buddy. Very good. See, it's so good being here, even be here and celebrate on your birthday, so very good. Uh, tonight, friends, we're on to lesson four, so we're going to be talking about the covenant with Abraham. Okay, and as, como, como mencioné, los que la tecnología no funciona, si no, no puede usarla, o no está funcionando, tenemos uh, el, el saloncito, el centro parroquial, con la traducción, si es necesario. Okay, muy bien. So, so we'll begin uh, recapping from last time. You remember we talked about the fall and the flood. And so you see from the fall, there's a rapid decline in morality, right? Which, because of intermarriage between the good line of Adam's line, Seth, and the wicked line of Cain, right? So there's that intermarriage going on, which leads to the flood. A new creation, which starts over with Noah and his sons and their wives, renewing the covenant with God. However, because of the sin of Ham, his line becomes cursed like Cain, and all the enemies of Israel descend from that line of Ham, okay? Noah's firstborn son, Shem, receives the father's blessing, and from his line comes Abraham 10 generations later. So at the fullness of the generations, we get to Abraham, or at the beginning of the story, his name is Abram, and it'll change to Abraham later, okay? Now, we're going to have a couple concepts that we need to learn for today, one of which is type. We haven't talked about this yet, but we've, we've run into it before. A type is a word meaning a person or an event that foreshadows a future person or event. So, for example, Noah, right, the, flood, the, the ark of Noah, it kept everybody safe from the flood. The ark is a type of the church, which has all of creation in it and redeemed and saved through the waters of baptism, we become saved and the new covenant family of God. So the, the, the ark becomes kind of a sign later on of the church, right? And we're going to have plenty of types that we're going to run into today. Don't worry if you didn't get that immediately. This is going to come up a lot, so it'll be repeated. Uh, the other word that we're going to need is go back to covenant, right? Remember we talked about covenant, which is extension of kinship by oath, but there are three kinds of covenants that we see in the Bible. And they basically depend on whether or not there's an equality in the power structure between the two parties, right? So a vassal covenant is where you have a master and a servant, or you've got like the king and his servants, his subjects, right? You serve me and I will protect you. So there's a, there's a master and there's a servant, okay? So there's superior and an inferior party. A kinship covenant, they're basically the same. They're on equal footing, right? And they enter into a partnership um, with each other. They're business partners, like you do this for me, I'll do this for you. We're kind of equal partners. The grant covenant is a gift. It's just simply, I'm gonna give you stuff, you don't have to do anything, I'm taking on responsibilities myself. And so today we're gonna see how at least two of these covenants are in play when we're talking about the promises God makes to Abraham, okay? So we're going to see, we're going to go ahead and start where, where we said we would in chapter 12. So we come to chapter 12, and we see right before chapter 12, we've got the list of descendants. And in, in chapters 10 and 11, they, I, I'm a nerd, so I counted things, okay? And you can, you can too, uh, if you want to check me. But there are 70 names that are mentioned in the genealogies. And that's 
indicative of all the nations of the world, the number seven, remember it was the number of perfection times 10, which is the number of completion, so 70 is the number of perfect completion, right? So it's a symbol of all the nations of the world are represented in that genealogy, and Abram's life comes in the context of that, that he comes from this one line, but he's going to minister to all the nations of the world. So that's his, he has a universal vocation. So that's what the scriptures are trying to say to us reading through the line. So now we come to the call of Abraham, or the call of Abram. God calls him and says, you're going to leave your country, and I'm going to give you three things. I promise you three things. Here we come to chapter 12, verse 2. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and by you all the families of the earth shall bless themselves. Okay, so three promises. I'm going to give you a promised land, I'm going to give you a great name, and I'm going to make you the source of universal blessing for the nations. Pretty cool. We're going to see each one of those promises confirmed by a covenant. Okay, so he doesn't just say it, he's going to actually enact the promise in a ritual fashion. So, uh, first of all, they, they leave their, their country. Abraham obeys God immediately. Abraham obeys immediately. And Abram and Sarai, they go to Egypt because there's a famine. So if you open your Bibles with me and you're on chapter 12, verse 10, it says there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt. Later on, we're going to see that the descendants of Abram are going to go to Egypt when there's a famine, right? So there's a type, right? He's foreshadowing something that's going to happen later. And then we see there's a kind of a weird story uh, of them kind of, you know, eh. anyway. So, but at the end of it, they leave, and they leave with treasure. So the idea is they go to Egypt during a famine, they leave with treasure. Does that sound like something we're going to hear later? Yes, the Israelites are going to be in Egypt during the famine, and then eventually when they leave, when they're liberated in the book of Exodus, they're going to leave with a lot of spoils. So we already see in Abram, a prophetic uh, idea of what's going to happen later with the whole people of Israel, okay? So just moving on from that, um, if we have questions, we can go into that later. I just want to make sure we get through all the important stuff, okay? So Abram takes with him his wife and his nephew, Lot, and, and his, wi his wife and their possessions. After coming out of Egypt, there's so many possessions, so many cattle, they can't live together. They can't graze in the same place. So Abram says, I don't want there to be any bad blood between us. You can pick whichever side you want to go. You go that way, I'll go that way. And Lot's kind of a turd, okay, because Lot does. He looks at the land, he says, okay, we've got High Plains Desert over here, fertile farmland. High Plains Desert, fertile farmland. I'm going to take all of that. <laughs> And so he goes to the city, and one of the cities where he stays is Sodom. Sound good? No. Okay, Sodom and Gomorrah, of course. He goes to Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham stays in the high plains desert um, with God. Right? So we see kind of that happening. Um, then the Lord says to Abram, this is verse uh, 14. He's basically reminding him of the promise of the land. Lift up your eyes, look from the place where you are. For all the land you see I will give to you and your descendants forever. I'll make your descendants as the dust of the earth. So if one can count the dust of the earth, your descendants can be counted. All right. So, so again, he's promising the promised land that he sees. Basically, he's promising the whole fertile crescent. It's a big swath of land uh, in the Middle East. Okay. So now we come to chapter 14. Lot is hanging out in the city, and there's a lot of inner Nicene conflict between the cities. He's captured, and so Abram goes to rescue him because that's the duty as a kinsman. So he goes to battle against the five kings with his men, and he's victorious. So he's kind of amazing because uh, that's a lot more. Uh, he's, he's, he's facing bad odds, but he's, he defeats them through the blessing of God. And when he comes back from the battle, we come to uh, verse 17. When after his return, from, this is chapter 14, verse 17, after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was priest of God most high. And he blessed him and said, blessed be Abram by God most high, maker of heaven and earth. Blessed be God most high who delivered your enemies into your hand. And Abram gave him a tenth of everything. Now, that little phrase right there, it's almost a blip. You'd almost miss it. Have you heard this name Melchizedek before? Where do you hear it? In the Mass, right? In the Eucharistic prayer. This guy's pretty important. This is the only place we hear about him in the Old Testament. Uh, I, I take that back. We hear about him again in the Psalms, don't we? And then we hear about him again later on in the book of Hebrews, right? So uh, if you want to know more about Melchizedek, read Hebrews 7, and it'll explain all of this stuff in great detail. But essentially, Melchizedek, um, we have to ask a couple of questions. Um, where did his priesthood from? Like, we haven't had any priests yet mentioned except for Adam, who's kind of a prototypical priest, but you have to read through the lines to understand he's a priest. He, this is the first guy that's explicitly called a priest in the Old Testament. So that's pretty significant, isn't it? So where did he get that priesthood? And he's a priest of God Most High. He's not a pagan priest. So wait a second. 
He's a priest of the true God. How did that happen? <laughs> Where does that come from? Right? It's a big mystery, and the Jewish people don't really know. But the fact is, is that when we get to the book of Hebrews, it says when you look at his name, Melchizedek, it's actually not a name, it's a title. Because in Hebrew, Melchi is king and Zedek is righteous. So he's the king of righteousness. That's what his name means. It's really a title. It's not his proper name. So we don't know what his real name is. This is his title. So he's the king of righteousness and he's the king of the town of Salem, which in Hebrew is Shalom, which means peace, right? That's the greeting that Hebrew people give to each other even today, Shalom, which is peace. So he's the king of peace. And this town, Salem, will later become Jerusalem. Jerusalem. So he is the priest king of the town that will later become Jerusalem, right? So you see all this stuff is starting to unpack here. What we have is a priest who kind of comes out of nowhere. And the book of Hebrews says, because we don't know his father and his mother, he doesn't have a father or mother. He just kind of is. <laughs> He's kind of this mystical character that just pops out of nowhere. And his priest, we don't hear that he dies either. He kind of lives forever. He's a priest who lives. That's what the Hebrews say. Now, that's pretty shocking, right? So he's saying basically Melchizedek has a priesthood that lives forever. That's why we hear Jesus is a priest after the order of Melchizedek. Because his priesthood didn't come from a lineal descendant like the Levites did. His priesthood came directly from God. Isn't that interesting, right? It's a spiritual interpretation. We could go a lot. There's a whole class we can do on Melchizedek. And I love Melchizedek. I hope we can. But I, I, I just want to just stop right there for a second and recognize. And what does he do? He offers a sacrifice of bread and wine doesn't offer an animal sacrifice, he offers bread and wine. And this is a prefigurement of later on King David will be instituting a type of sacrifice called the Todah sacrifice, the Thanksgiving sacrifice. And then later on we will see it fulfilled in the Eucharist, which is the true sacrifice of Thanksgiving, right? Offered by not Melchizedek, the earthly Melchizedek, but the heavenly Melchizedek, Jesus Christ. In fact, Melchizedek is so important that the Dead Sea Scrolls mention him so much, the, the, the Essene community that was around in the first century, they were waiting for the Messiah to come back and they believed he would be, yeah, sorry, were you always, oh, sorry, oh, sorry. I mean, he was, we, we recognized that Melchizedek was uh, an expectation that he would, the Messiah would be a priest king like Melchizedek, right? So the Essenes were waiting for this guy to come back, right? They, they wanted a priestly Melchizedek and they wanted a kingly Melchizedek. They actually wanted two, but that's another story. So if you want Dr. Bergsma, he can teach you all about that in his Dead Sea Scrolls series. Okay. Anyway, um, just know that it's important. What's really cool, though, is to recognize from a practical perspective, though, who really is this guy? Like, is he really an angelic figure? I, we can see it in two ways, a spiritual way, but also a physical way. Um, I would suggest to you that this is something interesting because Abram allows him to bless him. Melchizedek blesses Abram. Now, we have to say, who's been blessing so far? It's been fathers blessing sons. The father blesses the firstborn son right? And that's been going on and on and on. And we have to ask the question, why would Abram submit to this guy for a blessing? Because only a greater blesses a lesser. If you count the ages, and there's what's really fun, if you go back and check me on this, it's really fun. It says that um, if we count the descendants going from Noah to Abram, Shem, the firstborn son of Noah that received the blessing, is still alive, for a hundred years more. He almost outlives Abram. He's still alive until 40 years before Abraham dies. So the fact is the firstborn blessing hasn't really passed on yet because he's not about to die yet. So from a practical perspective, because again, this is the same book, right? We're not talking about Genesis timeline and then Exodus timeline. We're talking within the context of Genesis that's using the same kind of time. From the perspective of the story, Shem is still alive. And so it is very theoretically possible, although not dogma, but the Jews believed it. The Jewish rabbis believed this, that in fact Melchizedek is nobody else than Shem, the son of Noah. And so the blessing from Noah passes directly from Shem, skips ten generations, and comes to Abram. Woo! Isn't that fun? You got, that's why you got to count the numbers. They're not just put there for a device, right? You can actually count them and realize, well, that's pretty interesting. Anyway, so... That, whether that's true or not, kind of fun, but we have to move on. Okay. Although I don't want to. We have to keep moving. Okay. All right. So now we come to chapter 15. So after this, now God is going to ratify the, the covenant of the land with a, with a sacrifice. So God calls to Abram in a vision. He says, fear not. I'm your shield. Your reward will be very great. This is chapter 15, verse 2. Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless. The heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus, one of his slaves. Abram said, no, 
uh, the, the word of the Lord came to him, this man shall not be your heir, your own son shall be your heir. When God says something, it's going to happen. So he promises, no, you will have a son and he will be your heir. Then he brings him outside and says, look toward heaven, number the stars if you're able, and count them. So shall your descendants be. He believed the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. Okay, we go down a few more verses. He says, how am I to know that I'll have the land? And he says, bring to me a few animals, cut them in half, and uh, separate the pieces. Okay, so he did. Birds of prey came down on the carcasses. Abram drove them away. Verse 12, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. Now, wait a second. Does that strike you as odd? As the sun was going down. What did we just hear God do with Abram a few verses ago? What did he bring him outside to do? Look at the stars. Is it daytime? Ha! Huh! <laughs> It's daytime. How many stars can you see when it's daytime? Well, you can see one. You can see the sun, right? But you can't see all the rest of them because it's too bright outside. But he says, trust me, they're there. Just so your descendants are there. Isn't that cool? <laughs> and Abram believed God. It was credited in my righteousness. Neat. Anyway, so moving on. As the sun was going down, now there's a vision where uh, uh, God says to Abram, Know for a surety your descendants will be sojourners in a land that's not theirs, will be slaves there for 400 years. Is he prophesying the Exodus? Yes, he's prophesying what's going to happen in a couple books later. But I will bring judgment on the nation they serve. Afterwards, they shall come out with great possessions. So remember what Abram did, it's going to happen to his descendants, right? He comes into Egypt and leaves with great possessions. Okay, so it's a promise of God. As for yourself, you'll go to your fathers when you're buried at a good old age. And they shall come back in the fourth generation. When the sun had gone down, it was dark. A smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces. So what's happening here is kind of a, a covenant-making ritual. To make a covenant is to cut a covenant in Hebrew. So because you would normally cut animals in half, like they're doing here, and you would walk between the pieces. What this is doing is it's kind of like cross my heart and hope to die, stick a thousand needles in my eye. If I break my end of the covenant, may I become like these animals. That's what it's saying. So you're invoking a curse upon yourself if you don't keep the, art, the agreement. But here's what's fascinating. Does Abram walk through the pieces? No. Who does? God. God walks through the pieces. Can God die? No, but God is swearing. He's saying, look, I'm so serious about this promise that I'm going to take this upon myself. He's not asking Abram to do anything. It's a grant covenant. I'm promising you this. Isn't that amazing? There's, by the way, there is no other God in the ancient Near East that is like this. There is literally no... Everything that people are reading in this goes, this is completely different from the other pagan gods because the other pagan gods are only interested in lots of uh, like plunder and spoil and, and making everybody their slave. There's no God that just gives a gift like this. Nobody. So, so the God of the Hebrews is very different from all the rest of the gods. Okay. All right. So now we have a fall that happens. So after this promise says, you're going to have a son, he comes to Sarai and tells her, hey, hey, honey, we're going to have a child. And he's like... Honey, you're 75, and I am not much younger. Um, why don't you go into my maidservant? So again, they're trying to use human reasoning to fix God's plan. And it says, Abram listened to his wife. Where do we see somebody listening to their wife before, where things went bad? Yeah, that's right. All right, exactly. So we have a second fall, right? We have, instead of listening to the word of God that says, you guys are going to have a child, they say, that's not possible. How can we make it possible? We'll try and figure out something. Ancient surrogate technology, okay? <laughs> right? So nothing ever changes. We do our own thing. And because they don't respect their marriage and God's plan for it, it introduces division. Because immediately after the slave conceived, what happens? How dare you do this to me? She res doesn't respect me. It's like, you wanted me to do this. What's wrong with you? You know? <laughs> So the fact of the matter is we see that when we don't respect marriage, like, it just, everything falls apart, right? So uh, eventually, um, it's, it's reconciled slightly. But now, it says Abram was 86 years old when he had his son Ishmael. And Ishmael, the Ishmaelites, are enemies of Israel. And we see that today, the Muslims believe they descend from Ishmael, right? So are the Muslims and the Jews friends? No. So you see, one decision to disobey God has had catastrophic consequences for centuries. And yes, it's really bad. So we recognize repentance is needed. So we come to chapter 17 where we have sort of a rebuke of Abram. He's saying, walk before me and be blameless. Now he's 99 years old, so 13 years have passed, right? And God says to him, walk before me, be blameless. I'll make my covenant between me and you and multiply you exceedingly. So now he's going to do the name change and make his name great, okay? So he's going to renew the covenant, but there's going to be a couple of changes. Now it's not unconditional. Now he's got to do something, and it's pretty painful. So I drew a knife here because <laughs> uh, circumcision, it's not fun, okay? But it's saying this is now 
the sign of the covenant that if you and all the males in, the, in, in your family are circumcised, then I will bless you with a great name. So it's sort of a ritual rebuke and a discipline of the sexual faculty, saying that you can't just do whatever you want. You have to obey me. This belongs to God. Consecrate, consecrare, is to cut something apart, right? So it's basically saying, I want you to consecrate your body and your flesh particularly to me so that it obeys me and not your own ideas. Is think that's important for today? Better believe it's important for today, right? But the question is, um, does this still requirement still stand to be circumcised? We'll come back to that later, okay? But we see there's a couple things that happen. Abram's name now changes. His name gets bigger. Now it's no longer Abram, it's Abraham. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of many nations, okay? So his name gets longer, which is a sign that his lineage is going to get longer and he's going to have a lot of descendants. Okay, so that's what's happening in chapter 17. So um, the covenant, and then at that very day it says Abram, Abraham circumcises himself. He's 99 years old and his 13-year-old son and all the slaves and all the male people in the household. So it's like, that was a fun day. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. Um, in any case, uh, he, God then says to Abraham, this is in verse 15, as for Sarai, your wife, you'll not call her Sarai, but Sarah. So Sarai means princess. Sarah means queen. Okay, so now not only does Abram's name change, Sarai's name changes too. To recognize it's not by Ishmael that you're going to have the promise. You're going to have, he says it now very explicitly. In case you didn't hear, I said you will have a son and you're married. The implication was you're going to have it by her. I guess you didn't get the message. Let me be very clear with you. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. <laughs> You've waited now 13 years longer, so if you thought it was hard back then, it's even harder now. But is anything impossible for God? No. <laughs> and so therefore, but Abram, Abraham laughs. He says, ha, <laughs> no way. That's not going to happen. And God says to him, right? <clears throat> God says to him, oh, oh anyway, sorry. That's, that's more Sarai. Okay. So Abram, he laughs, and he says, Shall a child be born to a man who's 100 years old? Shall Sarah, who's 90 years old, bear a child? And God says, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac. And Isaac means he laughed. So he says, you're going to laugh at me? I'm going to give you a son, and I'm going to call him laughter. There you go. I'll show you how funny you are, Abraham. <laughs> you know? So in any case, um, now we have in chapter 18, God appears uh, to Abraham, and there's this interesting story in chapter 18. We see sort of a, a prefigurement of the Trinity. We have the Lord appears to him as three men. And what's interesting is you're reading this. It's really interesting. It goes between singular and plural back and forth quite a bit. It says the Lord appeared to him. This is chapter 18 if you're following along. The Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent. He lifted up his eyes and looked and behold three men stood in front of him. So the Lord is coming but it's three men. Interesting. And then when he saw them, he ran from the tent to meet them, bowed himself to the earth and said, my Lord. So he's addressing them in the singular, even though they're in the plural, right? So something mysterious is happening here and it's really not clear what it is, right? But it keeps going back and forth. Now we come to verse nine, after he's prepared a meal for them, they said to him, where is Sarah, your wife? He said, she is in the tent. The Lord said, singular now, I will surely return to you in the spring, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And then Sarah laughs. Ha, ha, ha. So again, they both laughed. How am I, after I've grown old, my, and she's laughing to herself, okay? And the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I bear a child that I'm old? Is anything too hard for God? At the appointed time, I'll return to you in the spring, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah denied laughing, saying, I didn't laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, no, but you did. <laughs> the Bible's full of fun humor. It's just like when you get caught in the act, it's like, I didn't do that. Yes, you did. <laughs> you just imagine God having a little like, fun smile there. Anyway, now we come to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, which of course um, is, uh, is so often misinterpreted today for political purposes, right, to try and um, eliminate what's actually going on. There's a lot of people who deny that Sodom and Gomorrah is about homosexual behavior, but it, as a matter of fact, it very much is because we see in the details very clearly Right? The men of the city, this is verse 19, chapter 19, verse 4, uh, the angels come to visit Lot because they're warning him that this town's going to be destroyed and he's going to have to leave. They come, he gives them hospitality like before, but he doesn't see that they're multiple people. He doesn't see that they're one person. He says, my lords, when they come to visit him. So it's interesting, Lot's vision is not as clear as Abraham's. Abraham recognizes the divine visitation. Lot just thinks they're regular visitors. 
Interesting, huh? So living in the city, living in that environment, he is not as spiritually aware of what's going on, whereas Abraham in the desert is more cut off from the noise and the chaos and can see things more clearly, right? So it's an interesting lesson for us that we should think about. So then it says in verse 4, before they lay down the men of the city, the men of Sodom, both young and old, all the people to the last man, they're really being explicit about this, surrounded the house and called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may know them. Right? So it's very clear what their intention is. Right? And, uh, and Lot, of course, is kind of a ding-dong and kind of trying to figure out what to do and doesn't really offer a great solution to that, um, offering his daughters instead, which is not great. Um, but in any case, they, they, uh, they're infuriated by this, and they try and break down the door. The angels make them blind, uh, and they're not able to find it. And so now Lot leaves the city, the angels, but they have to beg him, basically. They have to drag him out of the city. He doesn't want to leave. Isn't that fascinating? It's like he's kind of resistant to leaving, even though it's, it's a bad place. Right, so you say in verse 15, the morning dawned, the angels urged Lot, saying, Arise, take your wife, your two daughters are here, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the city. But he lingered. So the men had to grab him and seized him and led him out by the hand, right? Be, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him forth, set him outside the city. When they brought him forth, they said, Flee for your life. Do not look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Flee to the hills, lest you be consumed. And here's the amazing thing. Lot says, Oh no. No, my lords, behold, your servant has found favor in your sight. You've shown me great kindness. I cannot flee to the hills, lest disaster overtake me and I die. Behold, yonder city is not too far away. Can I flee over there? I mean, it's like, you get out of here. Like, what's wrong with you, right? You, they told you they're going to blow up the city. Get out of here, right? But it's just, we see that attachment to sin, even if we know something bad is going to happen, it's hard to get rid of it. That's a lesson for us, Right? Even if we know something's bad for us, sometimes it's hard to leave it, and we need God's help. Sometimes we need to be dragged away from it, right? And uh, pray to God that there are people that help you if you're stuck in your sin, right? Because uh, it's hard to get out sometimes. So they get out just in time as fire and brimstone rain down upon Sodom and Gomorrah um, and destroy everything. Okay. All right, and then we have... uh, they're in the hills now, uh, and his daughters uh, get dad drunk, and so we have sort of a, a repeat of what happened to Noah, right? And so we have sort of the daughters, they're like, they lost their husbands because their husbands didn't want to leave the city, and so they died in Sodom and Gomorrah, and, uh, and they commit incest with their father, and the offspring of those unions is, are the Moabites and the Ammonites, who of course are other enemies of Israel. So again, we see corruption of relationships in the family, corruption sexually, leads to horrendous problems, war, division, all these other things. So there is no such thing as a private sexual decision. They all have public impact. And so it's really important. Again, so why was circumcision so necessary? It was saying, because if we don't consecrate our bodies to the Lord, disaster happens. Society breaks down. As John Paul II told us, St. John Paul II, as goes the family, so goes society. Right? So we have to realize that the family is God's vision. He wants to heal the family, but as long as we don't respect the plan for our bodies, um, the family continues to fracture more and more with each passing year. Okay. All right, let's go ahead and turn this over. We now have the birth of Isaac, and of course, uh, Isaac and Ishmael don't get along, and so uh, Ishmael's kicked out, but don't worry, God will take care of him. And now we come to chapter 22, which is the most, the keystone of all of this. This story of the binding of Isaac is a really difficult story, and it's important that we look at it correctly, because if we read it incorrectly, we get the wrong messages. We need to read it the way the church reads it, and the way the Jewish people read it. Because when people read it now with 21st century eyes, they look at this and they say, this is barbaric. Right? And it is. From, and, and we have to recognize something that... It's, the message is not that God wants child sacrifice. The message is not that God uh, plays with people's emotions or whips them around or asks them to do something that he doesn't want them to do. That's not the message of the story. The message of the story is we have to look at typology. Remember types? Typology is the study of the types, right, of the things that foreshadow other things. When we look at this story, it is full of typology. The Jewish people did not understand the purpose of this story, except they tried to figure out in their minds that perhaps the only reason for this story is to show us why animal sacrifice works. Because there's only one sacrifice that's really acceptable to God, and that was the willing offering of Isaac. Let's look at the details. All right, God tests Abraham. He says, take 
he says, here am I, take your son, your only begotten son, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering on the mountains that I will show you. Okay? So again, God has made a promise. He said, I will bless you, I'll give you a son by Sarai in your old age, and from him all the nations will be blessed. The book of Hebrews goes into this again. I actually, I'm thinking it would be good as kind of our homework for next time, read the book of Hebrews and read these chapters seven through nine because you're gonna see very, very clearly um, what's happening here is that, um, oh boy, ah, how can we get to this in time? Okay, let's try this. Isaac is not a little kid. That's what, first of all, first misconception we have. Isaac's not a little kid. What's he doing? He's carrying the wood for his sacrifice on his back. How much wood do you need to burden an animal? Quite a bit. He's a beefy lad, okay? He is a strapping Scotsman, okay? And he is carrying, and his dad, his good old grandpappy dad, is over 100 years old. So if Isaac don't want to be tied up, no way Isaac going to be tied up. Does that make sense to anybody? He's going to be like, get away from me, old man. He's going to run, right? Or he's going to beat him up with one of the sticks he's carrying on his back, right? So the fact is, is that Isaac is a willing offering. Changes the whole game. Isaac figures it out. He's going up the hill and he says, hey, dad. Yes, son. So we got the wood, and you've got the knife and the fire. Where is the sheep? And dad, dad says, God, this is, this is a triumph of translation. We've got to hear this. Okay. This is in verse 9. Or sorry, verse 8. Chapter 22, verse 8. It says, Behold the fire and the wood. Where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. Not a lie, and very prophetic. Because, say, God will, provide a, God will provide a sacrifice himself. God does, in fact, provide a ram, right? So he does provide the lamb himself. But in the future, says, God will provide himself as the lamb. Woo! Changes everything, doesn't it? Right? So now we see a prophetic reference that the Jews wouldn't have understood and only becomes clear when Christ offers himself on the cross what's going on. Because when you tie up a lamb... Right? You usually skewered it across sideways and head to toe, and you carried it that way. So Christ is the lamb who's being bound and tied and offered to the Father as the lamb of sacrifice. Right? So we see that Isaac, there's a lot of typology for Isaac. Isaac is a willing offering. He's the only son who is loved by his father, the only begotten son who's dearly loved. It's repeated three times. This is your beloved son whom you love. Right? He carries the wood for his own sacrifice on his back. But we realize Isaac doesn't die. God didn't want him to die. He, didn't, he only wanted him to be willing to die because he's going to die in Isaac's place. He's going to offer himself. God wants to do it himself. Again, it's a grant type thing. He doesn't want humanity to do that. He wants to do it. God wants to do it for us, to bless us. So the ram, it says a ram is supplied in the thicket. Okay. Um, it says that when the angel comes, when Abram's ready, that he lays him down on, the, altar, on, the, on the, the wood and is about to take the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord calls him from heaven and says, Abraham, Abraham. He says, here am I. There was never a faster here am I in all of scripture. Yes. <laughs> Do you want to say something? <laughs> now would be great. <laughs> kind of busy. No, I'm not, I'm not busy. Not busy at all. Please interrupt me. Yes. <laughs> It says, do not lay a hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know you fear God, seeing you've not withheld your son, your only begotten son, from me. Right? And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram, offered it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So the ram also is a type. The ram dies in Isaac's place, but do you notice his head is also caught in thorns? Isn't that interesting? Huh, wonder, oh, 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 yeah, look at that. Huh, weird. All of these things, you know why, why the Jews converted? I mean, the disciples were all Jews, right? And because they saw that all of the prophecies of old, literally everything in the scripture talks about Jesus. Everything, every page has Jesus on it in some way or another. That's why you've got to read the Bible typologically. This is a very Catholic way of reading the scripture. You see everything in light of Jesus. Isn't that amazing? Man, it's, it, that's, it, it's amazing. So after this willing offering of Isaac to God, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham, this is verse 15, a second time from heaven and said, by myself 
I have sworn, says the Lord, because you've done this and have not withheld your son, your only begotten son, again, there it is, right? I will indeed bless you, and I will multiply your descendants as the stars of heaven and the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies, and by your descendants shall all the nation of the earth bless themselves. Now, this is actually an area where the RSV gets it wrong. It pluralizes it, especially by your descendant, by your seed. So this is what, through your seed, all the nations of the earth will bless themselves. It's really important because when you have it in singular, it can mean both the plural and the singular, right? And so it's saying, yes, through your descendants, that's one of the meanings, all, your na- all the nations will be blessed through your line, but also by one particular individual, there will be universal blessing that comes. So that's what's really important is right here we have a messianic prophecy also that's going to be fulfilled later. All right, so that is essentially the end of the lesson today. And I finished early. I can't believe it. Wow. I got there. So I, what we'll do, because we're not, uh, we have a little bit of time. This is a huge lesson. I want to open it up right now. If there are immediate reaction or questions or things were confusing, you want clarification before we go into small groups, you can raise your hand right now. Got one over there, so we'll run Mike back that direction. Over there in that corner over there, yes. Keep your hand up so Lorenzo can see where you're at. Very good, thank you. I like questions because sometimes they allow me to remember things I was going to talk about and I forgot. And so if there's, you're thinking about it, probably somebody else is too. In the, notes, in the notes you have on, on the board, you describe the three different covenants, vassal, kinship, and grant. Yes. But every time you mention a covenant tonight, you always made the reference to a grant type of covenant. Can you elucidate a little bit more? Yes. So the Genesis 17 is a vassal covenant because now he has to do something. He has to circumcise himself, right? So before, he didn't have to do anything. It was just a blessing. So that one, there are conditions attached to it, right? Yes. So good question. Thank you for the, the clarification. Yes. Was there another one? Or did... Oh. Oh, fo- follow. Yeah. Don't want... Yeah. in the future as well. Can you speak to the nature of the new covenant in relationship to these, these types? Uh, yes. So, so the question is, uh, these covenants also are types that look forward to new things. Um, what, what I would say is, yes, more accurately, as, as we kind of laid out in the first night where we looked at, you know, kind of the seven covenants or, or, or sort of a structure for looking at things, um, these promises, so God has made promises and ratified them, but he hasn't fulfilled them yet. There are going to be fulfillments of these promises with three later covenants. And so the three fulfillments, we're going to see the, the land is going to be fulfilled with the Mosaic covenant, right? So that's going to be fulfilled at that point in time. They're going to be given the promised land, not just been promised. Now it's theirs. Then we're going to see the Davidic covenant where the great name is established because now the great king has come and there's a kingdom that's firmly established. So that promise is now fulfilled, but only provisionally, right? Because the kingdom doesn't last, Right? So we're going to see it still needs a full fulfillment. The same thing with the land, because they don't keep it forever. Right? And even today, they don't have it. Right? So we have to ask the question, if God is faithful to his promises, how has he kept them today when Israel no longer has the Davidic kingdom nor the promised land? Great question. He, in fact, has kept his promise. That's going to be for your small groups to kind of hash out a little bit. But yes, and the third one, universal blessing, that one seems pretty obvious. We have to wait a little bit for that one until Christ Jesus comes. And then he, the seed of Abraham, the one descendant to whom the promise, on whom the promise rests, fulfills what was promised to Abraham. Great. Yes. I can give you mine. If Abraham had another son and Isaac, he loved Isaac, did he not love his other son? Great question. Okay, so this is kind of an interesting thing, right? Saying Abraham does love Ishmael, right? So he does love him. He's his son. But because there is this animosity between, obviously, his wife and the, 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 the slave girl and the son, he has to, they have to separate. So they have to separate from the house. Now, Abraham prays for his son that he would receive a blessing. And in fact, he does. And so um, Ishmael has 12 princes from his line. So indeed, the great name blessing does go through Ishmael. And in fact, we see that if in fact 
the Muslim claim that they descend from Ishmael is true, that's debatable, but if it is, the fact is, is that they in fact are very numerous and populous throughout the world, so the blessing of Ishmael has in fact taken root, right? Great question, yes. All right, one more and then we'll, we'll go into small groups. I'll, I'll use mine because I'm over here. Uh, did Abraham had, have some bias for one of his sons over the other? Yes, very much so. Yeah, very good question. Yes, of course. Because God told him, like, it's not going to be through Ishmael. You know, you, you, you did things your own way, right? But I actually have a different plan than you do, right? And so, um, now, if you're 100 years old <laughs> and your wife is in her 90s and you have a child, that's a pretty miraculous thing, right? So the child of the promise, the child of, of God's miracle promise, like, there's something really special about that, right? So there is a deep love and affection for Isaac, whereas Ishmael is just, well, it's, 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 a, natural, it's a natural birth, right? It's, it's, a, you know, it's just how things go. So good. Let's go ahead and we will, we will break at this point for small groups. Those who are going um, with RCIA can go ahead and go with Danielle to separate first uh, into the parish hall. Those who are um, uh, doing faith uh, preparation for sacraments or entering the church can go there. I'm going to give you three questions. Uh, RCIA have different ones, I think. But uh, this would be the questions. So the first one that I mentioned, if God's faithful to his promises, how do we see them fulfilled today when Israel doesn't live in the whole, when, when the kingdom of Israel doesn't exist anymore and the people don't possess the land stably, right? So how could that be fulfilled? How could God be keeping his promises today? Uh, a second question is that we see Lot's spiritual vision is clouded by being surrounded by the culture in the city of Sodom and he responds pretty slowly, whereas Abraham responds more clearly. What spiritual lessons can we take from that? And how, what kind of things should we be aware of in our own spiritual life? Or how have you noticed that in your own spiritual life? Maybe talk about that a little bit. And then maybe whatever else you want to talk about, something else you might have learned tonight. Okay? Go ahead and break. And then the youth will stay here with me um, here in the room with their, with their parents. Okay, so the high schoolers, if they could sit here in the front area, um, per pew, it's going to be six high schoolers, and we're going to divide into small groups, and then same thing goes on the left-hand side, middle schoolers, um, six per pew. Ready, set, go. All right, so parents who are here, um, you can go ahead and you can get into small groups yourself, uh, wherever you like in the pews. Los padres que están aquí pueden tener grupos pequeños entre sí, uh, aquí si quieren, ¿verdad? Y vamos a tener grupos uh, por, los, por los jóvenes uh, aquí enfrente. Okay, muy bien, good. All right, cool, we all kind of, all right, middle school, high school, all right, good deal. Okay, so do you have a system yet, Lupe, that you wanna, you wanna use for like, oh. do, you have, do you have a system for the breaking up into groups? Okay, all right, so, all right. We're going to take exactly 
45 seconds, and you will get in groups of five to seven, okay? Five to seven, and then get together in a pew. 45 seconds, middle, high school over here, middle school over here. Ready, set, go. go. When you find your group, first thing you do, introduce yourself, name, and where you go to school, and your favorite flavor of pizza. Go. Okay. Okay, all right, so everybody gets to go around, so make sure that each person gets to say something, okay? You can say pass, but only once, and then it comes back to you and you gotta go, okay? So you can do it once if you're not ready. Make sense? Okay, but you don't get a get out of it. You can't weasel out, okay? First question, what was one new thing you learned tonight? Ready, go, three minutes, five minutes, boom.
All right. This one's a little harder. All right. Why don't you think about this? All right. Lot is in the city. Right. There's a lot of distractions, and so he doesn't recognize that God's visiting him. Right. And you've got Abraham over here. He's in the desert. Not a lot going on. A lot of quiet. Right. I want you to talk about yourself. What is the biggest distraction that's keeping you from hearing God right now in your life? Sound good? Everybody stands to talk. Ready? Five minutes. Go. Okay. Okay. Perhaps maybe this one this would be good. So the whole point of this class is to get us to love the scriptures so that we don't feel like the book is just a mystery to us so we can actually use it. How many of you have a Bible right now? All right, not everybody does, okay? That's a problem, we gotta fix that, okay? If you don't have a Bible, you need to get one. And so we wanna make sure that you have one, okay? So if you don't have one, 
please talk to Lupe so we can make sure that we get you one, okay? Really important, we're in week four, and part of the homework, there's really no homework for this class except reading the Bible, right? So if you can't read, then we're, well, we need to talk to your school so we can help you to learn to read, okay? Because you're in middle school, right? You should be able to read, but if you can't read, very well, and it's hard for you to read it, there are great Bible apps where you can listen to the Bible, read to you, okay? But I would encourage you, if you have reading difficulty, right, that we get you the help there too, right? But the fact is, is that um, the Word of God, we should either be reading it or listening to it every day. That's really the homework for this class. Listening to it or reading it every day, even if it's only for five minutes. Remember, I want us to aim for a half hour, because that's what the church gives us in a plenary indulgence for if we do a half hour of scripture reading. But it's okay if you're not doing a half hour, but you gotta do something, right? Okay, so we have to at least open the book every day, even if we only read a chapter or a couple of verses, okay? Start somewhere, sound good, okay? Because if we don't read the word of God, we don't listen to it regularly, the class that we're going through won't stick. What God wants for you more than anything else, more than head knowledge, is he wants you to have a relationship with him. And that only happens if we pray every day. So what I want you to talk about, among your groups, no judgment at all about it, but like, do you pray? And if so, is there a favorite time of the day where you like to pray? And if you do, what's a favorite prayer that you have? Go, five minutes, go. Sergio.
All right. Does anybody here have a hard time praying sometimes? What, what, what would you like to know about how to make prayer easier? Is there any, anything you'd like to know? Yeah. How do you not fall asleep when you're praying? Great question. Well, first pray, don't, um, try and, try and pray when you're not super tired. That's first. Because if you wait till it's like 10 o'clock at night, you're probably going to be tired when you pray, right? Make sense? So are you talking about like just being tired in general or like when you start praying, you're fine and all of a sudden you're getting really tired when you start praying like that? Okay. Yeah. You can pray against the tiredness. And what I mean by that is like if you feel tired and you start to think about other stuff, you start to fall asleep, it's just like you just call yourself back up like, Lord, help me. Lord, help me stay awake. It's just a quick prayer. It's just a quick reminder. It doesn't have to be a long prayer. It's just quick. It's like, Lord, help me to stay awake. Lord, help me to focus, right? So I find that helps. I usually, um, I try and make sure that I'm praying when I'm the freshest in the day. So when, as soon as I wake up, that's my prayer time. Because that's the best part of the day. So you give your best part of the day to God. Some people are not morning people, and they're saying, that is not the best time of the day, Father. You are a liar. No, I'm not a liar. <laughs> it's just, uh, some people need to get revved up a little bit. But it's saying, even in that, offering it to the Lord, it's a very fruitful time of prayer. Maybe it isn't your most fun time of prayer, but it is fruitful. Yes? Was Jesus born on Christmas, like exactly Christmas Day? Whew, great question. Was Jesus born on Christmas Day? What do you think? So there's good reasons for and against it. What is a good reason for it? Yeah. We have a whole holiday. We we have the holiday, right? Obviously, that's what it is, right? What, Douglas? Yes. Um, It's the day when the darkness is either the shortest or, no, it's reversing. There's starting to be less darkness. So it's right after the winter solstice. So the light is now getting longer. Very good. But there's actually a reason biblically that we can think that Jesus is actually born either on December 25th or very close to it. Do you know why that is? Who else's birthday is related to Jesus' birthday? Not Mary. Actually, so, so think, about, think about this. Was there another relative of Jesus that we know when he was born a little bit before Jesus was? Who's that relative? Yes. Uh, John the Baptist. John the Baptist, very good. Right. John the Baptist was born how much earlier than Jesus? Can't quite remember. Okay. Okay, so let's, let's look at this. So when the angel appears to Mary, how pregnant is Elizabeth? This is the sixth month for her who was called barren. So when Jesus is conceived, it's the sixth month for Elizabeth. So, so basically from that time, John the Baptist is born three months later after that time. And now there is six months after John the Baptist's birthday is the birth of Jesus. Make sense? Okay, because it's... Do your math here, okay, right? Okay, three months into the pregnancy. How long is a pregnancy usually? Nine months, okay, so nine minus three is six. Very good, all right, so six months after John the Baptist's birthday is the birthday of Jesus, okay? Do we know when John the Baptist's birthday is? The answer is yes. We actually have good historical evidence for the birthday of John the Baptist. The scriptures tell us when it was Zechariah's turn to be the priest in the sanctuary, we know what tribe he was in, and we know roughly the amount of time for when Jesus was born within a few years, and so we know the rotation of the priests, and so we know, in fact, that John the Baptist's birthday is June 24th, or right about there. So we have good historical evidence to know the birthday of John the Baptist, and since we know the birthday of John the Baptist, six months later from June 24th is December 24th, which is Christmas Eve. Ding, 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 ding. Cool, huh? So there's very good historical, and now there's a good article about this, so if you want to know the actual uh, research behind it, because, because you have to know the way the Jews did calendaring and how the, the, the rotation of the priestly tribes went, but, but those who have studied it, it's, it's very clear that we know 
because it, the, the rotation, it takes a couple years to get through it. So if it's Zechariah is in this tribe, it would have had to happen this year or this year, right? And so we know that, that the time of the year that happened was in the summer. So we know he was born in the summer, which means Jesus was born in the wintertime. So it's reasonable to have those dates. And in fact, John the Baptist's birthday is right after the summer solstice, so it's right after the longest day of the year, where now the light is decreasing. So what does John the Baptist say? He must increase and I must decrease, right? So John the Baptist is not the light. So after his birth, it gets darker and darker until the darkest day of the year, and then Christ the light is born, and then it gets brighter and brighter. Isn't that cool? And that makes sense because is God the God of history? Is he the God of time? He can make that happen, right? Everything speaks about Jesus. Even the heavens declare the glory of God. What also in the heavens told us that Jesus was coming? Was there a sign in the heavens that told us Jesus was coming? Did somebody see a sign in the heavens? Yeah. The star, yes. So wise men were looking for a star in the heavens and they followed it, right? So the fact is, is that there's this cosmic clock that God is in control of and he's saying, when this star gets right here, that's when my son's going to come in a way that even the pagans can find God if they're watching. Kind of cool. Other questions? Yes. Sorry. Yeah. The microphone is not following around here. Come on, Joseph. Right. What if Adam were to actually warn his wife about the, the fruit? Uh, very good. So, so the fact is, is that she, he did, in fact, tell her and because she, so, so he told her beforehand, and so because she wouldn't have known because she wasn't around when God warned Adam about it, right? So the only way that Eve would have known it is because Adam told her, but we're not sure what Adam told her, if he told her well, or if she wasn't listening well, right? So we don't know that for sure. But the fact is that the reason why she fell is because she was listening to the serpent instead of telling him, get out of here. Like the serpent is contradicting God's word, and as soon as he says, don't listen to God, she should have been like, uh, who are you? Get out of my face. That's what we should do. As soon as we hear the voice of the enemy in our life that says, hey, you should smoke that. Hey, you should go over here. Hey, you should do that. Be like, get out of my face. I'm not interested, right? right? Really important. We don't play with the devil. We don't entertain any conversation with him because he's going to win if we keep talking to him because he'll trick us. And so we got to be really clear, careful. He's smarter than we are. He's not smarter than God, but he's smarter than we are. And so we have to recognize, I need to listen to God and not to him, because he'll get me tied up in knots. Yep. Good. Other questions? Yeah. And then over here. Yeah. So when God said to uh, Abraham, you'll have as many descendants as the stars in the sky, is that true, or is that like an expression of some sort? Good question. Yeah, obvious, obviously um, Abraham hasn't had as many children as there are literal stars in the heavens because there are billions and billions and billions of stars in the heavens there haven't been that many people born uh, throughout history so yes it's obviously a metaphor yeah yeah very good question yeah has jesus ever celebrated christmas well he did when he came i'm sure <laughs> yeah i mean do they celebrate birthdays the same way we do I, I don't i don't know yeah so he wouldn't have been like hey it's christmas it would have been like it's my birthday you know so anyway but I don't know. I wasn't there. You should ask him. Actually, that's a good question. What's one question you want to ask God when you get to heaven? Like, did you celebrate Christmas? Don't ask that question. Ask something better. Anyway, other, <laughs> I hope you have a better question than that when you get to heaven. But some people's like, did you get presents on your birthday? Really? That's what you waited to ask me for? Anyway, so uh, any other question? Yes. Um, that's right. Yeah. Okay, so technically speaking, since there's other universes, would Jesus also run all of those other universes, or would it be just the Earth itself? Or does he control whole, or God, technically? Would he, all, would he control all universes, all timelines, all space rifts? Yeah, so, so the, the theory of multiverses and multiple universes is a theory. We don't have proof for those things. And so if, in fact, they existed, yes, God would be Lord of all those timelines, too. But we don't need to believe in those things because they're just theories. And most of the reason why people invent those theories is to try and get around the question of God. The reason why they invent the multiverse is because they don't like the fact that the universe has a beginning. Because if it has a beginning, and before then it didn't exist, it means somebody had to start it. And they don't like that idea. So atheistic scientists create this idea that there are multiverses. Because 
they want to get around the idea there's a God, but they can't get around it because a multiverse uh, or these other things, it's like, okay, I mean, sure, it might, it might work that way, but you're dodging the question because even if there are multiverses, how did those get started? You can't explain things by saying something else caused that forever. You have to get to a point, and this is Thomas Aquinas, by the way, if you, if you get in arguments with people and you're like, there is no God, this is what you have to go back to them. Who started everything? They're like, oh, it just, uh, it just goes on forever. No, it doesn't. The law of entropy, this is a, a nice physics term. How many of you are in physics? Anybody? Right. The law of entropy says that energy decays over time, right? So the fact is you can't have something go on forever and ever and ever because it's going to run out, right? There has to be a point where there's a creation, right? Because you can't keep going backwards forever. It just doesn't work. You can't do that. It's illogical. I'm not sure if we asked this question, but if we did, I forgot. Okay. Why did Satan take form as a snake? Why did Satan take form as a snake? Uh, good question. Because um, it's the story. <laughs> right? It's to say, it's kind of like asking, well, why are women the way they are? Why are men the way they are? I don't know. It's the way God made them, right? Serpents in every culture are a sign of craftiness, like intense knowledge and wisdom, like in Chinese culture, like dragons are very, very devious, but also very wise. And so we see in every culture that, that serpents are a symbol of, of sort of evil or of craftiness or, or of other things. And so how does that happen? Because there had to have been a primeval event that was known to everybody. So the fact is like, what comes first? the story of the snake and our belief about them, or our belief about them and the story of the snake, right? It's, a, it's saying, why do we believe that about snakes? Probably because of this story and other stories like it in ancient cultures. Yeah. If it's the story, it's, it's one of those things where, again, we, there could, we could be in any number of stories, right? But this is the story we're in. And the way God's writing it from the beginning, it all makes sense, right? So they, that's why, if you don't study the Bible, you don't know why we operate the way we do, because this story is the story of human history. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a particular reason why God chose to reduce the lifespan of humans from the time when Adam started and then after the flood, mm -hmm. that's significantly reduced? Yes. Yeah, the Lord, the Lord says that pretty clearly because of sin, the lifespan will be shortened now just to 120 years. So it's because of sin that life gets shorter. And that's, and that's really, it, it's clear. It's saying, well, how does death enter into the world? Death enters in because of sin. And corruption happens because of sin. So the more sin multiplies, the more corruption there is. Right, so it's just a logical consequence. So people's shorter lifespans are a sign that things are getting more corrupt. Right? So that's why the scriptures say a long life is a blessing. Right? 70 years for those, or 80 for those who are strong, that's a blessing. Right? So people who live into their 100 years, it's like, wow, you're on the way extended warranty here. You know? I just, I just anointed a 101-year-old lady at the nursing home today. She's spry. If she wouldn't have fallen and broken her hip, she wouldn't have had a walker. But she's just like, it's getting around. It's like, whoo, I got to sit down. I'm like, girl, you're walking around pretty good. <laughs> like, for 101, I hope I'm as good as spry as you are when I'm 100, you know, if I even make it, you know. Yeah. How do we pray when we don't feel like praying? Ah, very good. How do we pray when we don't feel like praying? The best question, right? How do you love somebody when you don't feel like loving them? Do you love your kids? Are they sometimes hard to love? Yes. Do you love your siblings? Do you love your brother and sister? Yes. Are they sometimes hard to love? Yes. You choose to do it because love is a choice. It's not a feeling. And so the fact is, is that if you recognize that God has done something for you in Jesus Christ, he has offered his life for you, he's created you, he's given you new life in the sacraments, then of course I'm going to pray. I'm going to talk to him. If I don't pray, it's a sign of ingratitude. It means I don't understand my life and where I come from, right? So to pray when I don't want to, I just need to remember who I am. I'm nobody. I'm a creature. And who is God? God's the creator. He made everything. I need to stand with wide open mouth, amazed at what God has done. Because even if nothing else happens for me in my life, I have reason to pray. I have reason to give thanks to God the rest of my life, just because God made me. 
Oh, and if it wasn't enough that he made me. He's keeping me in existence right now. The fact that you're sitting here breathing, taking in breath and breathing it out is because God is keeping you in existence right now. Because without him, you can't do any of that. You need him for everything. So once we realize we're radically dependent upon God, prayer is easy because prayer is just lifting your heart up to God who loves you. But if we don't think about him, if we don't think about the reality of our life, then yeah, we'll never pray because I'm just looking for happiness here in this life and I forget the purpose of my life. Right? Um, a reminder, um, because as I was talking to some folks, I realized a couple of things. One is that some people still don't have Bibles. We're the fourth class in. If you don't have a Bible, you got to get one because you got to read the Bible every day or get a Bible app, okay, so you can hear the Word of God, right? If you are late without an excuse, right, then that's not good, all right? So because this is what we need. If, you're, if you miss the whole content of the class, you still have to watch it at home and make it up, okay? Really important because um, unexcused absence is two of them and it doesn't count for the class, right? So we gotta make sure if you're gonna miss or if you need to be late for, for a legitimate excuse, you need to let Lupe know beforehand, okay? It's really important. We're gonna get a retreat date on the calendar pretty soon and so we'll have people sign up for that. We're also gonna have volunteer opportunities as well, okay? If anybody wants, I didn't mention it last time, but we had the question box. Um, question can in the back. If people want to submit questions anonymously, they can do so uh, during the breaks. Looks like we've got a couple in here, we'll see. And we'll go ahead and we'll start with those. And then we'll take other questions. Yes. Did Jesus have pain while on the cross? Absolutely. Yes. He did have pain on the cross. As you can see, that was not fun, right? Now, um, yes. Very simple question. Okay, good. Was the Garden of Eden a physical place or was it metaphorical? Great question. Um, the, the church teaches pretty clearly that, that Eden's a real place. Um, the, the scriptures, the first couple of chapters of Genesis are prehistory and so they are revealing to us very deep spiritual truths, okay? So um, Eden doesn't exist anymore, so nobody can go and be like, here's where Eden was. Like, we don't know because the, the world has shifted so much because of just cataclysmic events that we can't go and find it. Like, it doesn't, it doesn't exist, right? And so it's hard to say one way or the other whether it's a metaphorical place, but we have recognized if we say it's a metaphorical place, we say Adam and Eve are metaphorical, then sin's metaphorical, that's a real problem, right? So the fact is, is that, that, yes, it's a real place. Adam and Eve are real people. We descend from an original set of parents, and that's genetically plausible as well. And so the fact is, is that, yeah, it's a real place, there's a real fall, did it happen exactly that way? It definitely could have, um, and it seems like unless we have a better alternative, it's better to believe it than not. So, there you go. What's the difference between a Baptist church and a Catholic church? Whew, boy, oh boy, you mean the building or the people? Man, yeah, the buildings are quite different. Um, I don't want to get out of my depth because I'm not a Baptist theologian, um, but uh, there's, there's quite a few differences uh, in the Baptist faith, and I'd, uh, I don't want to speak out of turn about theological differences because uh, I'm not as fresh uh, in my Baptist studies, okay? So perhaps somebody here who is a Baptist can illuminate that better than I can. Um, obviously, they don't believe in the sacraments of the church except for baptism and potentially marriage, um, but uh, they, they have a different concept of it than we do. Um, they don't, they don't believe in the Eucharist, obviously, um, as we do, or confirmation, or holy orders, or and, and really any of the sacramental system, the priesthood, uh, the Blessed Mother. I mean, there's, there's many, many differences between the Baptists and the Catholics. Um, the very fine detail stuff I, I don't want to get into because I, 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 I'm out of my depth there, so I don't want to speak out of turn. Yeah, good. Other questions that people have, and feel free to raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you so that you can be, be heard. Got a question back here in the back. And then another one over here in the front after. Or go ahead, you first, Oliver. Yeah. This isn't really a question, it's just a statement. There's a, really, there's a really good three book series so far on the Catholic faith and all that. Uh, uh, Brendan and Irk in Exile. Who, who wrote it? Uh, some Catholic podcasters. What is it called again? Brendan and Irk in Exile. I, I don't. I still didn't quite understand the title there. Just I didn't hear it very well. Brendan and Earth in Exile. No. Brendan and Irk. Ur. Ur. In Exile. Yeah. E R C. I, I, I'm not I don't know. This just this takes place in the future, apparently. Oh, it's like a novel. 
Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, yeah, comic book novel. Oh, it's a comic yeah. novel. Okay. Yeah, I haven't heard of it before. Yeah. 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 Okay, my question is, uh, when Isaac was going to be sacrificed and a ram was provided, is there a reason why that was called a ram and then Jesus was called the lamb? I mean, I, I understand, you know, but was there a reason for the two different types? Yeah, typolo this is, it's important we remember typology is not perfect. So if you're looking for exact every single detail, foreshadowing, you're not going to find it, right? Some things are very clearly connected, but if you push any analogy too far, it falls apart, right? So it's to say, okay, well, God will provide a lamb, and it's not a lamb, it's a ram, so therefore it's not true. It's like, come on, like, we, we've got to be a little bit more flexible in our, in our metaphorical uh, understanding, right? A ram is just a male sheep, right? You know, so it's like, okay, um, and a lamb would be more of a younger, you know, uh, but a, but a ram would be an adult male sheep. And so you see very clearly there still is that, 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 that symbolism that's happening, that typology of Christ who is the adult lamb of God, right? Because a lamb's a younger, yeah. Yes, Douglas. Why does oh. one of the prayers yeah. say that he first descended into hell? Uh, why, does, why does the creed say he descended into hell? Is that what you're asking? Good question. It's partly a translation um, because he descended to the dead, right? So in our understanding, when we say hell, we have a particular idea about it, which is a place where the souls of the damned go, right? Those who have rejected God through their life and they die in that state, they go to a place of torment called hell. In the Jewish understanding, or when we hear hell in the Bible or Gehenna, they have a different slightly different understanding of it, and, and it depends on what context they're talking about it, right? Uh, the, the realm of the dead, which is Hades, they have a distinction between Gehenna, which is hell of the damned, and they have Hades, which is the realm of the dead, right? And so for them, because heaven is not open yet, we're waiting for the Messiah for heaven to be open. People who die, who are good, don't go to heaven, but they don't go to hell either. And so the question is, where do they go? Well they go to the place of the dead. During this time, that's what's where they are. They're, they're in sort of an antechamber, if you will, or like the bosom of Abraham is another word that they use to describe it. It's not a place of torment, but it's a place where they're waiting. And so when Jesus descends to the dead, what he's doing is going to that place where the righteous are awaiting the Messiah. He liberates them and then brings them up with him to heaven, right? But because we don't have a distinction in our English uh, language we don't we don't talk about different stratifications now any longer when we just say hell like we descended to hell it's a little confusing because he's not going to the place of the damned because people who are in hell cannot be saved because they've made a choice to reject God and they're there permanently right but what Jesus is doing is he's going down to the place of people who were good but they couldn't get to heaven because the door was shut from the Garden of Eden, right? So that there was no way for them to get to heaven. So now Jesus opens the door and he becomes the door that leads to life. Great question. Yeah, very good. The creed's good to study because we recognize there's, each line has great truth in it. Yeah, yeah. Question up here with Mary. Yeah. And, or Douglas, sorry, first Douglas. There is often lots of depictions of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit when they come into earth and they have different forms. So yeah. today we learned how there are three men, but Abraham was able to see them as the Lord. Yeah. Can you tell me some of the other forms that they have taken? Uh, well, so, so until the coming of Christ, right, we don't have a clear understanding of the Trinity. So the fact is, is that really, this is a mystery to the Jewish people, right? To them, it's like, okay, three strangers, like, but yet they're single. How does that work? It's kind of like in creation where it's like, let us make man in our image, right? It's talking the plural, but so, so again, there's, there's confusion. We don't exactly know how it works until Christ comes and he says, I and the Father are one, right? And he says, and I will send you another advocate. So once we see Jesus in the flesh, now we have a clear understanding of how the Trinity works, but it still took a couple hundred years to figure out. And the experience of Pentecost, which was a different experience because now they're experiencing God through the power of the Holy Spirit, which is different than their encounter with Jesus, but it's still the same God, right? And so the Holy Spirit reveals who Jesus is, and Jesus reveals the face of the Father. 
right? But it, this is a whole class. We can go into the Trinity, right? So in the Old Testament, we tend to see the Holy Spirit is the one who inspires the prophets, tends to be the one who comes upon them when they're giving a message, um, and the word is what they speak, right? So the word of God is what they speak, and then they're in relationship to the Father. So we do see that relationship, but it's very hidden. We don't see it revealed until Jesus comes. Yeah, Mary. And then we got to get... Through, through time, the, the Jews were reading this, you know, the scrolls, or they had the same, much of the same information about the foreshadowing of Christ, and yet many chose not to recognize him as the Messiah, and they're still waiting. Where did they diverge? What was the confusion, or do you, do you know? Can you speak to that? Well, prophecy is always clearer in hindsight, and that's the problem, right, is that prophecy doesn't make sense in the moment. It's like when God's promising, your kids will be 400 years in slavery here today. It's like, wow, really? And then in the fourth generation, they'll return. Like, what does that even mean, right? And then the exodus happens, and you go, oh, right? The fact of the matter is when you look at the cross, the cross is the fulfillment of hundreds of prophecies. But in the moment, it looks like an execution. It looks like he failed. Because there's also scriptures that say, cursed be anyone who hangs on a tree. Right? So they're like, what's the, what's the deal here? He was supposed to be the Messiah, but he's being hanged like a criminal. And in fact, being cursed by the way he's dying through the Old Testament. And so we're saying, this does not look like the Messiah we were expecting Right? Because there was clear messianic expectation for certain types of messiahs because they couldn't know for sure. And so really only upon reflection after the fact, because even the disciples didn't get it. I'm saying all the disciples left. So it's not surprising that mainstream Judaism didn't get it. The only reason they got it was because Pentecost happened and the disciples, their minds are open. Jesus is explaining to them for 40 days the scriptures. He opened their minds to understand the scriptures we hear after the resurrection, he breathes upon them, says, receive the Holy Spirit, right? Until they got it through the Holy Spirit, they didn't understand what the scriptures meant either. So what we're doing is a study, but really what we're doing is we're receiving insights that came from the Holy Spirit. This is not Father Mark's idea. This is not Dr. John Bergman's idea. This is stuff that came through the teaching Christ himself on the road to Emmaus, right? What does he do? He's walking alongside and explaining to these two. They say, well, it all stinks. We thought he was going to be the Messiah, but instead he was crucified. And now they're saying, the crazy ladies that came back from the tomb, that he's risen from the dead. We don't know what to make of it. And Jesus says, you knuckleheads. You knuckleheads. Did not all this have to happen so the prophets and the law would be fulfilled? We see prophecy is only clear in hindsight. That's why it's so dangerous when we have prophets who are saying, the end of the world is nigh, and, the, and these things are going to happen. It's like, okay, we have a particular idea of what that's going to mean, but we don't know until it actually happens. And then we'll see. So the, the, the truth of the matter is, is that we need to live for God right now and not be putting our hopes in a particular prophecy. We've got to say, look, we have enough. We already have the revelation of Jesus. He's already told you what you need to do. You need to obey the Father. You need to be Catholic. You need to receive the sacraments. You need to pray. You need to serve. These are very simple things. We just want something exciting, you know? And so what are the Jews looking for? They were looking for somebody who would free them from the Romans. They were looking for somebody who would you know, restore the kingdom of Israel. It's like, that's what the disciples say. Lord, are you going to this time restore the kingdom to Israel right after the resurrection? Because they still don't get it. <laughs> they still think in terms of human things. And Jesus is like... It is not for you to know the time or the season. I'm got to leave, and I, these ding-dongs still don't get it. You know? But don't worry, I will send power from on high. Do not leave the city until you are clothed with power from on high. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and then you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the world. We've got to get ready for adoration because we're at the end of time. <coughs> <coughs> Maybe the end of my life. Okay. <coughs> okay, homework for next time. Finish Genesis. Yes. So, 23 to 50. So, this is something I've been hearing. Some, some, some of you are not reading. Some kids are not reading the Bible. Okay, so I have to, just, I have to tell you, you better start reading or you're going to get behind. Okay, so read. If you have a hard time reading, or if you don't have a Bible, talk to Lupe before you leave so we can get you one. Parents, you need, if your child can't read, you need to read it to them. Okay? 
really important, and talk to your school to help them to learn how to read better because it's their job to teach them, okay? And your job too, so we can all read together, good. Otherwise, we have apps that can listen to the Bible uh, so you can hear it, okay? Really important that we do that, okay? There's the, the Hallow app, which has the Bible in a year. Um, that's it's also free as a podcast, the Bible in a year. Um, you, can, you can listen to that too, okay? Great. Let's go ahead and we'll prepare for uh, exposition. <coughs> O salutare sostia, qui celi pandis ostium, bella premunta stilia, da rober fer auxilium, unitri noque domino, sit sempiterna gloria, Qui vitam sine termino, nomis donet in patria. Amen. Jesus, truly present in the most holy Eucharist, we ask that you be with us this week. Give us the grace to pray. Help us to eliminate distractions so that we might enter into your word and receive its fruits. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.